as Tony was sharing that, that we worship him in spirit and in truth, that we are spirit. Next week I want to talk on the Holy Spirit and prayer and speaking in tongues and what the power is of speaking in tongues. Now, tongues isn't a salvation issue, but when you get saved, you get tongues. When you get saved and come to Jesus, you can access more than we are. And part of next week is based upon here when I'm going to talk about the name. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. And I've shared before and talked before about baptism. And the word baptism, baptizo, was a word that was used when a ship would sink into the ocean. And when the ship would sink into the ocean and the ship would drop down into the ocean, they would say the ship was baptized because the water wasn't only just around the ship, it was now inside the ship. But there was a story in 2013, a remarkable story about survival. And it was survival of a Nigerian cook called Harrison. Harrison Okini. Does anyone remember or heard that story? And Harrison, and he was on a, a boat that was heading out to the rigs, and he was the cook, and he said, <laughs> he actually said when you read the article, he was on the toilet when the storm came. And when the storm came, it tipped the boat upside down, and the boat sank. And from the crew of 12, Harrison was the only survivor. And the reason that they found out that he could survive was because while the boat was upside down, not all the water was in the boat. And there were pockets of air that he was able to breathe. He lasted almost three days before he got found. Three days of hypothermia and trying to rig himself up underneath the inside this boat that would stop him from sinking into the water, losing consciousness. And three days not knowing whether someone was going to save him. And then the, you can see, actually see the video of the divers come down. This boat was 30 meters underwater and the divers came down into this boat and they, they got the shock of their lives. And he said, I reached my hand out slowly just in case the diver got a startled fright. Could you imagine that? Diving down into a boat, thinking that everyone, it's been three days, everyone has passed away, you're going down, your job is to salvage the bodies, and this hand goes, gotcha! And his hand reached out. And Harrison survived because while all the water was in the boat, not the, what, while the, water, the boat was in the water, not all the water was in the boat. And so often in our lives, we move as one in the Spirit. And while the Spirit is in us, yet not all the Spirit is everywhere in us. And we have pockets of flesh, pockets of self, pockets of what we desire that we survive on and breathe on, that last gasp of what I want to do, that last gasp of what I think I should do. It's probably more what I think I should do than what I want to do because God's interested in what I want to do. That last gasp of things. And so how do we shift in this journey of Christianity to change and move and grow so that there are no pockets of flesh left inside our vessel? That's the goal of the Spirit. Jesus said that you would die to self. If you want to follow me first, take up your cross and then follow me. There was a... There was a... The iPad's frozen. There was a video that came up on my feed that um, it just started playing, and it was actually quite interesting. It was by a guy that I'm sure a lot of you have seen and heard, uh, Torben Sondergaard, who's heard of him. And he did this, he did this picture, and, and it just struck me by what he said. Silk, if you could put that picture up, please. And so in this picture, we have four, he put up four pages the gospel, deliverance, cast your cares, renew your mind. And so often, I remember Pastor Darren Bagley saying that God took him somewhere. Now, a lot of people may not believe this, but I figure 
if God could transport Philip from the eunuch 30 something kilometers away, God could still do that today if he chose to do that. And Pastor Darren was talking about being transported. And Pastor Darren was sharing about how he moved, but he said, I'm not going to tell you what led me up to that because as human beings, we have a tendency to look for a formula. And a formula of, well, if Pastor Darren can do that, then I can do that. And we get caught in this formula of how things work. And Tobin was talking about when we're dealing with an issue. And he said, when we're dealing with an issue, and he used the issue, let's say, of lust. And he said, so often in, when we grew up in church, there was the first point of contact when someone wanted to be set free from something was deliverance. Get out in Jesus' name. Get out, you foul thing. The first encounter of a deliverance meeting that scared the bejesus out of me as a young kid was actually, Rebecca, your dad. Your dad was dealing and praying for someone and he got thrown back and I was sitting. This is youth. This is a youth meeting. And this guy, he just, all I remember this, he was just throwing, throw, threw your dad back. It was my first encounter with a deliverance ministry. Seals grew up in an encounter of deliverance ministry where they would see doors opening and closing. They would see a lot more things happen. And so often in church we think, well, that's the thing. Get out, you spirit of lust. Cast you out. And Torben shared this, this, I thought, was a really great point of view. For while the deliverance ministry is true, so often we forget about the first step, the gospel. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And perhaps sometimes it's not, you know Jesus, you know it's not deliverance because while we saw things happen and demons getting cast off, we also went into times as a church where we would see nothing happen. And I think today, I don't know, hands up if you've seen a deliverance ministry, if you've seen people manifest. Probably a quarter, if that. I know my kids have, Oh, my son David saw a little bit of it. It's, it freaked him out too. We don't see that as much. And it's not that I'm looking for that. It was the season of what God was doing. But I still know God can, there, that demons flee at the name of Jesus. But there's another aspect that sometimes it needs that encounter with Jesus. Someone who doesn't know him. That the first point of call has got to be, Give your life to Jesus. Do you know your Lord and Savior? And then perhaps it's not just that. For some who've grown up, it's cast your cares on Jesus, releasing it to him through different areas. And one of the areas he pointed out was forgiveness, that being unable to forgive someone else can put a blockage in your life. And perhaps it's not that area there. Perhaps it's renewing your mind. And he presented these different scenarios that I looked at it and went, yes, that's so true. We're looking for a formula of get out, you foul thing. We're looking for a formula of you just need Jesus. We're looking for a formula of, well, just read your Bible more and pray more. We're looking for a formula instead of trusting that the Holy Spirit knows you better. And letting the Lord bring you through. It just takes a willing heart. Thanks. We open up our Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 7. 17, not 7. In Genesis chapter 17, in verses 1 to 8, we read the passage that God had a purpose for the land and God had a purpose for Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Could you imagine God changing your name at 99? At 99 years of age, I just got used to my name, Abram. And God says, no, we're not calling you Abram anymore. We're now going to call you Abraham. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. It's incredible that God put that part in there. And kings. 
when he deliberately later on says to him, says to the nation of Israel uh, that they didn't need a king, they needed him. But he already spoke it back. We serve a God that knows everything. We serve a God that nothing, he is not surprised by anything. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Amen. And I will be their God. Abram had, this wasn't the first encounter, as you know, that Abram had with God. In chapter 12, Abram, at a young, young age of 75, at a young, young age of 75, I've discovered the older I get, you're still young, and the threshold of being old just goes up and up and up. David, it just keeps going up and up. At a young age of 75, God instructs him to leave his family and go to a new land that he was getting. And we know that Abram takes that step of faith. In chapter 13, God shows him the land and he tells him, start walking through the land that you would see. In chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abram. And Abram has a vision and God tells him again that an heir will come from him. In chapter 16, Abram is now 86. At 86 years of age, Abram has a child. At 86, he's doing well. At 86, he's having a child. I don't know about that. We look at that today and we go, (coughs) that's disgusting. But at 86, he has this child. I know my younger brother. My younger brother, my dad was in his 50s when he had my younger brother. Mum and dad had Joseph. And um, when they had Joseph, I said to him, oh, how did you go? And he says, oh, it was a bit weird and difficult. But he said, you yeah, know, he's still dad. But he says it was a bit different. But he said, he said there were benefits because he didn't have to deal with other stuff of dad. And there were negatives. But he said, of course, the positives always outweighed the negatives. And he had to do that. And I know today people have children at different ages. Um, Seal and I, we just want to look forward to grandkids, not our own kids. At 86, 86, he has a child in Ishmael. And from 86 into chapter 17, Abram goes through this journey. And at 99, God visits him again. And he changes his name and he reestablishes his name. And so imagine this promise of God. Hands up if you've had a promise of God. Hands up. Who's Who's had something where God has said, this is a promise? I have. I've had multiple promises of God. And I have to say, sometimes we we want the promises of God to come into our now. There is a promise of God that Seal and I have been waiting over 20 years for. Over 20 years. And we still believe it's going to come to pass. Some promises come come to pass quick. And so Abram now at 99 has this promise from God. And so he's faced with this dilemma of, yes, but I have an heir, but this is not the heir I'm supposed to have. That God had promised him a son. And so God decides to do something with Abram and he says, no longer will you be called Abram, you will now be called Abraham. And God changed something in his name that he went from being called Abram, exalted or high father, to Abraham, father of many nations. Sarah went from being, Sarai went from being called Sarai, princess, to Sarah, which still means princess. I have a Sarah, and she is a princess. And it goes from princess, but mother of many nations, a princess, mother of many nations. Actually, it means my princess, mother of many nations. When God changes a name in Scripture, things happen. When God changes your name, Something changes and something shifts of what God is doing. Saul got changed from Saul to Paul. His name went from inquired for to small, humble. Wow, isn't that fitting for what Paul wrote? Asked for, inquired for from God to small and humble. Jacob went from deceiver to contend or fighter of God. Simon Peter went from listening 
Although sometimes I guess that's why they said Simon Peter, and I bet again probably they said multiple times, Peter is your name, but sometimes it was Peter. You need a bit more Simon. Simon meant listening, hearing, and Peter, of course, rock. People call each other by different names. As you know, that my, my name is Harold, but I get called Harry. That started years ago, and it's really hard to change. And, and something shifts in a name change. Growing up in a divorced family, in a family that is different of name, uh, DeVries wasn't my birth name. And so growing up in that family and before Seal and I got married, there was one thing that I wanted to do. For some reason, this was, this was early days, I went to the police station to get my license and my dad was with me. And I said, what are they going to do if they ask me for my name? Because I had my birth certificate, but my birth certificate didn't say DeVries. And he said, let's wait and see. They didn't ask. They didn't ask. So I wrote DeVries. And so everything in my documentation was DeVries. And while it was there and I wrote it, it actually wasn't my legal name. And I decided that I wanted my kids to grow up in the covering of the name DeVries. And so Seal and I talked about it and I said, I can't let my kids grow up with my birth name. I want them to grow up as one in the family, knowing that they belong in this family, knowing that they are part of this family, knowing that every rights and attributes of this family name will come upon them without a doubt or hindrance. So in order to do that, I had to do this. This is a legal deed poll. And so I legally changed my name to DeVries, even though I had a license and other documentation. I legally changed my name. And after I changed my name to DeVries, that, that by, according to the law, I was forever to be known as a DeVries. But it wasn't enough to just do that. In order to do that, the first thing we had to do, because we weren't Australian citizens, we were Dutch citizens, was I had to have this. You may not even have a piece of paper to prove you're an Aussie. Mike, Nadine, this, no, this is it. This is the document. This is the, the document that says, I am an Aussie. I am an Aussie. And so the first thing I had to do was to become naturalized. And when I became naturalized, I took on all the things, all the legalities, all what Australia had to offer, and then my name could come in. And when my children were born as DeVrieses, they were one and whole as the name DeVries. I'm sure through their life, sometimes they thought, well, can I change families? As kids mostly do growing up. But there are DeVries. You can't get around it. That is who they are when God changes your name. When God changes your name, no longer will your name be called Abram. It will be called Abraham. No longer will you be called lost. You will be called found. No longer will you be called sick. You will be called healed. No longer will you be called poor. You will be called blessed. No longer will you be called weak. You will be called strong. No longer will you be called unrighteous. You will be called righteous. I think you can see where I've gone with this. No longer will you be called unforgiven. You will be called forgiven. No no longer will you be called dirty. You will be called clean. No longer will you be called depressed. You will be called joy of the Lord. No longer will you be called slave. You will be called free. No longer will you be called anxious. You will be called peace. No longer will you be called orphaned. You will be called son of the living God. That deserves an amen because that's who you are. Come on, we can do a better amen than that. Amen. See, we took on that name in December 1976. I got a better piece of paper than this. In December 1976, in a place in Carbrook, beside a bed, as I knelt down and said, Jesus, I give you my heart, my name was changed from Harold DeVries unrighteous to Harold DeVries righteous, son of the living God. And all the attributes, all the things of God and who he is, is now accessible to me because I've got the paper. And so do you. See, the enemy will come against you. And the enemy came against Jesus and said, if you are the son of God. And when the Sanhedrin said to Jesus, 
If, if you are the son of God, are you the son of God? Something shifts. When, when God changes your name, dead things come to life. Sarah was unable to have children. But when God changed her name, dead things come to life. Romans 4, verse, chapter 4, verses 17 to 22. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who's got things in, that they go, this needs life inside it. This needs life. I think we all do. This needs a change. And what would appear to be dead, God calls things which appear to be dead and he breathes his life inside it. When God changes a name, God affirms his promise. He affirms it in Genesis Genesis 17. When God spoke to Abram and changed his name to Abraham, he reaffirmed again, I think for the third time, this is is who you are. This is what I'm promising. You know, we all need affirmation of promises. We all need that times where God is saying, don't forget, don't forget this is what I've spoken. Don't forget. When God changes your name, faith rises. Now, Revelations talks that in the end, he's got a stone with our name written on it. And for all the things that we could do and all the giftings we could move in, Jesus said, don't rejoice that you saw the signs and wonders. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? Rejoice. Rejoice that your name is written in his book. When God changes your name, faith rises. Abraham and Sarah didn't have a child, but the truth is what they were going to. Faith rose within Abraham at 99 years of age and and acts on what God said. You know, I think of Hebrews 11, 1, where faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Herein lies our questions and herein lies our dilemma so often because we can't see it, we often give up hope that it can happen because we can't see it. When God changes your name, age is not an issue. When God changes your name, age is not an issue. So often it's not a physical age that binds us. It's a mental age. I'm past that now. God can't do these things for me. God's not able to do these things. I remember someone had wrote a, uh, one of the revivalists, and I forgot who it was. I just remember that he said, the greatest years of someone's ministry can really happen after they're 60. What a promise. And that might have been for the time they're in. I don't think God looks at the age. He looks at a willing heart. But it's a great promise because it says it's never too late. It's never too late. Age is not an issue. When God changes your name, it's for an eternal purpose. And that eternal purpose isn't about you. You're involved. But I remember hearing one pastor say he threatened God. Who's ever threatened God in a prayer? He threatened God in his prayer. He said, Lord, if you don't do this, then forget it. You're going to have to find someone else. And God quickly replied, fine, I'll find someone else. That's not the response we want to hear sometimes. We want to hear God say, no, 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 don't quit. Stop, 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 stop. What do you want? What do you want? I'll change things, but that's not the God who we serve. Because if we will not praise him, the very rocks will cry out. Rather, it's the heart of David that says, oh, to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. What a delight it is that I'd rather be a nobody in the house of God than a somebody outside. Here's what was happening. For almost 12 months, Abram, And Sarai did this. And for whatever reason, God knew at this point, this is what they needed. For almost 12 months, and really it was beyond, this is what would happen every single day. Good morning, father of many nations. Oh, good morning, mother of many nations. 
What would you like for breakfast, father of many nations? I don't know. What do you have, mother of many nations? Are you going to cook it for me, mother of many nations? No, get it yourself, father of many, many nations. What are you going to do and go out to work today, father of many nations? I'm going to go out and see what the Lord has in store, mother of many nations. Shall we build the room already, father of many nations? Yes, we should, mother of many nations. And every single day, their testimony changed from what was dead to what was alive. Every single day, out of their mouth, confessing, 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 confessing. father of many nations. And here's another part we look at and go, he had one kid. One kid. How do you become a father of many nations with one kid? At least Jacob had a few more. But he has one kid and they confess it. Abraham, and not only did they confess it, Isaac confessed it. My father of many nations. Jacob confessed it. The father of many nations. The nation of Israel confessed it. The father of many nations. And this promise that comes through because God did one thing at the right point of time where he changed the confession of what was coming out of their mouth to one of restriction, to one of openness. And we pray for God to bring a breakthrough. We speak that he is the God of the flood. But does my confession change? Lord, you are the God of promises. Do I wake up in the morning and say, God, bless your name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your mighty name. For you are the God of promises. You are the God that will determine everything before me. You are the God that will bring into being what I'm waiting for you, O God. What I'm waiting for you to do. You are the God that will help Help me break free from the shackles. Lord, you are the God that helps me overcome my doubt. Lord, you are the God that helps me overcome my weaknesses. Lord, you are the God that helps me overcome the fleshly things inside, inside my life. Lord, you are the God. Holy Spirit, you are the one that reveals to me the things I need to change. Holy Spirit, you are the one that shows me how I need to shift. And this confession starts to change in our lives because we change our name from Harold to, I'm Harold, the son of Jesus Christ. I'm Harold, the bride of Christ, I should say, the son of the living God. I'm Harold, the son, and my father's in heaven. And he gave me the bride, and I'm waiting for my bridegroom to come back one day. And one day he's going to return, and he's going to receive me. But he said he's looking for a bride with spotless. He's looking for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's looking for one that would follow him, and he's given me instruction. And when he's coming back, the day and the hour I don't know. But he said to me to make sure my oil inside is filled, make sure my lamp is filled with oil. He said to me to fill up on the Holy Ghost. Fill up on the Holy Ghost. Fill up on the Holy Ghost so what is inside will start to flow outside. And at the appointed time, whenever my bridegroom returns, I will be ready. I will be ready for him. And in the meantime, the comforter, the friend, the one, the helper is going to come into my life and he'll show me the things I need to shift because it's no longer me that lives but Christ that lives in me. It's no longer me and I I learn, and this is one of the great prayers I pray. I said, Lord, help me to flow in spirit and in truth. Help me to flow not out of my soul that while you have given me these feelings and given these things inside me that it would come into alignment of flowing in the spirit because it's in the spirit where life comes in. The Holy Spirit has a way if we're open. Let me say this. That name of Jesus is an amazing name. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. When we stand... On the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before. In that mighty name of Jesus, we have the victory. And anyone who's been in church for a while would remember that song. See, we sang songs. There was a song for everything. There really was. 
and it's something we don't have today. But there was a song for everything. There was a song for gathering. I love this family of God, so closely knitted into one. He's taken me into his heart, and I'm so glad to be a part of this great family. He had songs. We sang songs for even in the name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Demons will have to flee. And so often we like the part of, well, I just want the gospel part and I just want the renewing of the mind part. But that deliverance part, oh, I don't know. But there is everything. If there is anything inside me, Lord, that would be a hindrance, would I be transparent enough before the Lord and say, Lord, deal with my sin? So we don't like to deal with most our sin. Next year, I've got a few messages that I wanted to do talking about sin. Can I share? I'll share something with you, and I, I want to pray. I hadn't intended to do this, but I just feel to do this. We think of ourselves so often as pretty good, but there are none good but God. We think of ourselves of doing well. I'm just doing the best I can. Yes, of course, because everyone is. But that doesn't absolve me from removing sin from my life. Here's how God reminded me to deal with an issue. He gave me a dream. I haven't even told Seal this yet, because I didn't know how to process it. He gave me a dream. And please bear with me. God was showing me in this dream in a way. I was in this dream. And I was lying down on a mattress for a rest. It wasn't for a sleep, it was for a rest. And there was a guy laying next to me. And as I laid down, this guy put his arm around. And straight away, you're going to go, oh, it's sexual sin. No, I'm just, God was making a point. And he's put his arm around me and and I moved, of course, I moved aside. And his hand kept trying to grab me and I moved aside. And then I stuck the pillow beside me. And it kept happening. So then I just got out of there. The mattress was on the floor and I just laid on the floor. And his hand kept coming. And then I said, right, I'm not doing this. And I got up and I laid on the couch. And the next day the Holy Spirit said, this is how we're meant to be with sin. We tolerate it. And we allow it in our lives. And a hand reaches across. And we just think if I just move across, then that's enough. If I just move outside the bed, that's enough. No, the Bible says flee from sin. Get up, get out of the bed, get out of the room, go to the couch and go somewhere else and flee from sin. And we wonder why there's no move of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit says, I I can't be there. See, my prayer has been so much, Lord, have your way, have your way. Have your way, have your way, have your way, have your way. Deal with me, Holy Spirit. Deal with me, Holy Spirit. Praying in tongues, deal with me, Holy Spirit. And the Lord says, deal with an attitude. Deal with how your heart is and remove yourself. He always does it in love. I believe God wants to change, you know. Sorry, I should rephrase that. God has changed your name. Because you have the name of Christ. But he wants that revelation to open up again in your heart. And here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to pray. And we're going to worship. We're morning tea soon. And and this is what I feel is, yes, I, I want people, if people want prayer and they would like me to pray for them, wonderful. But perhaps you would like to just stand at the altar and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Perhaps you would like someone to pray for you. I just want to make room as time has gotten away from me again. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord Jesus. And for even those watching online, I, if, if someone does not know the name of Jesus, if someone does not have, can we have every eye closed, every head bowed, That if you have not had that relationship with Jesus 
and you would like to renew that relationship with Jesus or you would like to have a relationship with Jesus, then now and today is the day. And it's as simple as just inviting him as I did in 1976. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I know I'm a sinner and I know that I need you. I believe that you died and rose again and because of what you did on the cross, I can be free. And I accept you into my life and receive you into my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And even for people watching online, that if that's you, reach out and we'd love to pray with you. Could we stand this morning?